you know, sometimes it can be hard to trust everything we have to God. And, but we have to remember we owe him everything. He created the world. He created everything. And we wouldn't be alive or breathing today if it wasn't for his miraculous creative power. And the fact that he created us is probably one of the most fundamental biblical, uh, you know, reasons why we owe everything to him. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And usually when you create something, that creation becomes yours 100%. Now, there are a couple exceptions to this rule. Slaves generally do not own anything. And sometimes ideas or inventions by employees are owned by their boss. I thought of a little analogy. Let's say, Chuck, you had a little side project. You're working on the side and it started making millions of dollars. And you were doing it while you were at work. Your boss might want a piece of that. But... God is the boss of the universe, and everything he created is his. And we're kind of under his ownership. Though the wonderful thing is he still gives us free will. <laughs> and God as a creator is also affirmed at the end of the Bible. And we read in Revelation 4, the 24 elders saying, You are worthy, O Lord, the service to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And I don't want to dwell on this too long, but I have a couple more quick little references that kind of reiterate this refrain. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In Psalms 50.10, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. And that's, yeah, Psalms 50.10. And both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all, and your hand is power and might. And your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. First Chronicles 29, 12. And then Psalms 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And then finally, Hebrews 3, 4 says, For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. That might have special meaning to some of us today. <laughs> So it's pretty clear that everything's owned by God. We might build a house and think we own it, but in the end, it's the Lord's. So if everything comes from God is a blessing from him, it only makes sense that we need to give back some to him. And so there's two ways mentioned in the Bible. I mean, there's many different ways, but two of the ways I'm going to talk about today are by giving tithes and offerings, and then also by giving him our time on the Sabbath. So basically, you ask for one-tenth of our money and one-seventh of our time as a bare minimum. And just the other day, somebody told me, well, actually, like a week ago, they're like, they said a very small percentage of Adventists pay tithes, and there's all this negativity about it. And I did a little research and actually found out a lot of positive information, so I'm excited to share it with you guys. But first, let's start off by studying what the Bible says about paying tithes. So it's first mentioned in Genesis, and we read, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. That's Genesis 14. So that was the first time tithes was mentioned. I'm sure it happened before. That's just the first time we hear about it. And part of the purpose of the tithes was to pay the priests or the Levites. And we read in Numbers, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel's an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And so our church, obviously, we don't have priests like the Israelites did. But we do use a lot of the tithes money to help pay for our pastors. And I'm sure that's usually kind of a sensitive topic for some people. And I looked it up, um, and just how much they make or whatever. And I'm not going to say the numbers here, but it was very much on the low end for a professional with a college degree. The numbers I saw were less than a public school, elementary school teacher would make. But then, to be fair, pastors do get a lot of extra, uh, you know, like retirement benefits and other stuff through their employer that not everybody gets. There's tax benefits through the IRS code. So in the end, I think they're doing okay. And so I've heard a lot of you know, negativity over the years. Like people are like, oh, only a small percentage of people pay tithes and whatever. But I found a study in Compass Magazine. It was very interesting. And 
I'll get to that in a second. But we hear all these statistics, and a lot of times I heard George Barna quoted. And so I did a little, I looked it up and I found an article, and it was very interesting. Like, I guess George Barna, he's not an Adventist, he doesn't even believe in tithing. He wrote, strangely, tithing is a Jewish practice, not a Christian principle espoused in the New Testament. Well, we know that's false. <laughs> so I went to Compass Magazine, and they did a study about 10 years ago in Northern California. And they figured Northern California kind of represents the general United States, I guess. <laughs> so I'm sure there's some differences. And they found among most age groups, about 65 to 80% pay tithes. <laughs> And the, you can see the younger age group's not quite up there, and a lot of them aren't even making money yet. They're still paying off their college loans. So um, they, I don't know, their situation a lot of times a little bit different too. And they found out a lot of interesting details in the study. And one of them is that much of the ties actually come from older, unemployed people. And other things, number one reason people didn't pay their ties was they simply forgot to. <laughs> So they, uh, that's something that definitely happened to me when I was younger. I remember when I was in college, I didn't really keep track of my finances that much. <laughs> I think my parents did. But <laughs> so they suggested we use like digital offering plates or just have more reminders to pay ties. And another interesting thing here, you can see for people that are over um, 80, I guess it's my things, it's kind of cutting out on the screen a little bit. But basically, the people that are in the oldest age group, over 80 years old, almost like 100% of them pay tithes. I thought that was pretty impressive or amazing. And, but then in the end, it doesn't really matter how many people pay tithes or how many people don't. What matters is that we still strive to do what is right. So why is tithing important? Well, Adrian Rogers said, God doesn't need us to give him our money. He owns everything. Tithing is God's way to grow Christians. And obviously, God doesn't, you know, he could make money grow on trees if he wanted to. But when we give, he is happy to work through us and bless the money that we give. And throughout this whole process, we're also blessed. So it's really important to trust him with our money. And then there's a passage in Malachi that I got to read. And this is one of the more scarier verses about tithes. But it says, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouses, that there may be food into my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So it ends with a really wonderful promise. And I was thinking, I guess I'll read that verse later, but there was one person in the um, Bible that robbed Jesus, and that would have been Judas, because he was taking from their money that they had for them and the disciples. So as you can see, it's really important to pay tithes, and God will bless us beyond measure, and he'll open the windows of heaven. And then I, I was wondering, I don't know if there's a clear consensus on this or whatever, but of course to pay tithes on net or gross income. And to make clear what that is, I found this statement online. In general, gross income is a total income you earn on your paycheck, and net income is the amount you receive after deductions are taken out. And so the kind of t verses that are kind of talking, referencing that a little bit is when Jesus was, the Pharisees tried to trick him. And it says, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. Then they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said, Why do you test me? Bring a denarius that I may see it. So they brought them, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to him, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and the gods that are things that are God's. So just my personal opinion, I feel like if we pay taxes on our gross income, maybe we should do that for God too. But it's a personal choice. Everybody's in a different situation. And to be fair, sometimes the government does take a lot out of our paycheck and taxes. It's crazy. <laughs> and so another way we can give to God 
is by giving him some of our time and by keeping the Sabbath. And at first, keeping the Sabbath may be hard, but it becomes such a joy and a blessing. I'm sure most or all of you guys have found that out. And I don't believe it's just about giving God 24 hours a week. Instead, we can be, you know, preparing and getting ready all week. And I really like yesterday we cleaned up our house. And we haven't always done that, but it's kind of a nice feeling on Friday to actually have a clean house, especially when you have kids and you're kind of living in chaos all week. But <laughs> so to start off, I'm just going to read the Sabbath commandment just kind of as a reminder. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy married servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So there are many reasons we should keep the Sabbath. I say reasons, it's almost kind of like blessings we get from God. And number one, most important, is it gives us time to spend with Jesus. And it's true, we can be talking to him all week long, but the Sabbath is really a day specially set aside. We can just have some peace and quiet. We're not working, and we can, you know, study our Bibles. And once a week, we come together at church and worship God. And the spirit of prophecy says that there would have never been an atheist or an infidel if men had kept the Sabbath. And this is because every week, our memory of God and all the miraculous things he's done is rehearsed and refreshed. And number two is the Sabbath reminds us that we have a creator. And um, first of all, you know, like the weekly cycle is a miracle itself. And there's no reason in nature why everything operates on a weekly cycle, at least that I've heard. And the French revolutionaries tried to change this. And they decreed the first year of revolution as year one, and they made the week 10 days long. And this calendar endured for more than a decade, lasting until Napoleon crowned himself emperor. I guess there's a lot of people who have tried to make changes to the calendar, but it's really stuck. And so another reason is the Sabbath gives us rest, and it gives us a break from the busyness of this world. And I don't see anything wrong with taking a little nap once in a while. I guess it's good not to sleep away the Sabbath every week. So Mrs. White wrote about how the Sabbath meets their necessities. God is merciful. His requirements are reasonable in accordance with the goodness and benevolence of his character. The object of the Sabbath was that all mankind might be benefited. God was not made up to fit, man was not made up to fit the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was made after the creation of man to meet his necessities. So I remember when I was a teenager or a kid, it was kind of hard on Sabbath to get dressed up and go to church. I didn't always really appreciate it, but... Over the years, my view on it's definitely changed. I really enjoy it now. And one of my favorite things to do on the Sabbath, which I actually like a little bit better in being in church, is to get out into nature and to witness the beauty of God's creation. And one of my favorite places around here is Sunset Beach Park in Swamico. I'm sure most of you guys have been there. And so I have one last quote before I end the discussion on the Sabbath. Though sin has entered the world to mar his perfect work, God still gives us to us the Sabbath as a witness that one omnipotent, infinite in goodness and mercy created all things. Our Heavenly Father desires through the observance of the Sabbath to preserve among men a knowledge of himself. He desires that the Sabbath shall direct our minds to him as the true and living God, and that through knowing him we may have life and peace. And just being out in nature and just resting, it, there's a whole lot of life and peace in the Sabbath, and it's really enjoyable. So I started out by talking how we owe God one-seventh of our time, and um, actually, I mean, one-tenth of our ties. But, sorry, I got this mixed up. So, yeah, we owe God one-seventh of our time on the Sabbath, but, you know, and we get so many blessings from the Sabbath, it seems really, once you've experienced those blessings, it's not that hard to give them that part of our time. And I hope paying tithes can be the same way. And also in the beginning, I read a bunch of verses on how we owe everything we have to God, or he owns everything. I'm just going to rehearse a couple of those. 
Psalms 50.10, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. And 24.1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. But a more, even more important reason we should be generous with what we have is that Jesus gave everything um, he had to come to this earth and to die for us. And he gave up his position in the courts of heaven, and he came here as a baby to be born as a poor, to a poor family. And the angels must have wondered, you know, at the scene in Bethlehem when the king of the universe arrived and there was only some poor shepherds that were there to greet him. And Luke 2 reads, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. So it was a really great honor and a blessing for the shepherds, but in reality, the whole world should have been watching for Christ coming. And I think probably the best years of Jesus' life were in Nazareth. But later he had to spend three and a half years hanging out with the disciples. <laughs> and I'm, not sh I'm not sure about you guys, but the disciples, they never sounded like they would be a, you know, a group of people you'd really want to hang out with. And literally, Peter and Judas, sometimes they were controlled by Satan. And it seemed like they did a lot to make Jesus miserable. And in John, we read... But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragment oil not sold for 300 denarii and give to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So he was hoping that money would go to him, and he was somebody that actually had literally robbed from God. And then Peter... From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, O Lord, that this should not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And that was quite a strong rebuke. I imagine if anybody said that to uh, somebody in church, they might not come back. <laughs> but it maybe shows something to Peter's character. You know, he stuck with Jesus to the end, or most through most of it anyways. And in the last hours of his life, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was pleading with God for another way, and his best friends, the disciples, completely abandoned him. And now, I didn't think the disciples didn't care about Jesus. They just weren't spiritually strong enough to withstand the devil's temptations, and they fell asleep instead of helping him. We read in Luke 22, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me, and nevertheless, not my will, but your be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to him, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So at the... Uh, Probably one of the hardest points of his whole life, his uh, friends weren't there for him. But at least God was, or the angel was. And then finally, the last thing Jesus went through was he died on the cross for us. And the pain he felt on the cross, the separation from his father, is something that we'll never fully understand. And I'm sure you guys have seen this quote many times, but it's always worth going through again. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute 
that made the cup he drank as bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So, yeah, a lot of really deep stuff with that. So it's like Jesus did so much for us, I can't, you know, we can't even quantify that hardly. And all he's asking is that we give one-tenth of our earnings, and he'd also like to spend one day out of the week with us. And beyond that, I don't, you know, God isn't really holding anything over it. His gift of salvation is a free gift. And all we have to do to be saved is believe in it and believe in it fully with all our hearts. And I came with a little analogy. Well, imagine that the Milwaukee Bucks were about to play game six in the NBA finals. And because we all live in Wisconsin, we should be Bucks fans. And what if somebody told you all you have to do to make them win is you just have to believe it'll happen. And it's really cool, the good news about Jesus and salvation is Jesus already won the game, and he's holding the trophy of eternal life to us, just asking us to accept it. And of course, when we accept Jesus as a Savior, we have to give it everything we have, money, time. You know, if he asks for it, we need to be willing to give it up to serve him who died for us. But it will all be worth it in the end.